So we're here at the Metal Hall of Fame. This is Neil Turbin, you're watching The Metal Voice, and I'm here with one of my influences, one of the people that I grew up with. Oh, you're being so nice. No, but I was there at Beggar's Opera, and I was there at um, Hammerheads, and I saw Twisted Sister. This is Mark Mendoza from Twisted Sister. And tonight, it is really me. And tonight is the reunion of Twisted Sister. No, it was, it was we got inducted to the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame. And you guys were- And we made an appearance here and played three songs. He's smarter than me, that's why he got it correct. But uh, it's, it's awesome to, to get a chance to talk to you, and thanks for taking the time, Mark, and uh, you know- It's they, ticking. You're Mark the Animal Mendoza. That's right, not Marco Mendoza. Who's that? I'd always yell at Marco's him. Marco's a friend I, of mine, I he's had cool. the first, Yeah, oh, he's a great guy. Great he's been people. on my show. But I always tell him I had the name first. It's okay. true. Drop it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And you're from the East Coast. So, yeah, exactly. You know, don't mess with the East Coast. No, definitely not. I wanted to ask you, Mark, about, um, you know, all the years coming up until now with Twisted Sister. So you guys were kind of doing your own thing on sort of a hiatus or a retirement or I don't know what. You, when? I don't know. Is there such a thing? When? In the music business? Well, I'm just saying, like, when, when was the hiatus? Um, from the last time you guys played live together? Which was in 2016. Okay. Yeah. So that's not really... That's not Six much. Years. Yeah. Okay. So I get Do it. Do the math. So, so the timing was just a good time to pull it back. Well, together. you know, we we all we did a lot of stuff. We got back together again. You know, of course, we played New York Steel in two thousand. You know, two thousand one for nine eleven. Right. And then in two thousand three, the office was so good that we got back together. And we didn't tour so much, but we did. Uh, you know, one offs the big festivals all around the world, and we did it for uh, what about fourteen years, fifteen years. And uh, everybody decided they want to do other things. And uh, so we never broke up. We just stopped playing. So I have a question for you. So back in um, the year was 1980, maybe one or 1980 or somewhere right around there. I was walking down 8th Street in New York by the Electric Lady. Yeah. And it had a, a, a clothing store flip or something that was right around there back in those days. So I remember that stuff. I can't forget. But so I heard on the radio as I'm walking. They were playing at that store, that clothing store. They had the radio going. I heard the first time, shoot them down on the radio. On, on, I think it was WPLJ. They and played shoot them down? Yeah. PLJ? I think it was Commercial PLJ. Commercial station like that? You or sure WNEW. You sure them. that they didn't just have the, the album at the time and they weren't playing that? That was before the, the album. That was your single. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They didn't have the single or and, something. And I saw you guys it. like at Hammerheads not too long before that. And then I, I came out to the village and I was there. And I heard that, and that was a big inspiration for me because it's like if I heard Twisted Sister on the radio and they don't have an album out, it's like. And you guys, what um, what JJ was saying about playing seventy five hundred shows or before Ridiculous you guys thousands, it's of incredible. Shows. The, yeah, who knows the tenacity you guys have. We had a ten year history before we got signed. It's like holding clothes. on and never letting Three go. Three shows a night. Well, when the band first started, it was five shows a night, six days a week. And, and, you got to get good at something doing it that much, right? And then, and, and there were some great bands in the East Coast and New York, oh, tri-state well, area. Full of those great bands, Rat Race great Choir and, and Zebra and Steeple Chase, Cross, and Steeple Chase, all of them, man. Every band was great. I mean, you guys were playing out before I was able to like go out and see bands, and right. then it's like, okay, now I can go. Right. And because um, we were talking with AJ, yeah, uh, my, my friend who you know is a bit older than me, he he saw you guys it's play at Kofstra College. Oh, and like, man, that's right after I joined the band. Like the beginning. Yeah. Yep. So it's kind of amazing that you guys held on for so long and stayed, stayed you know, focused, because that's, that's so admirable. We still to, are. You know, a matter of fact, uh, 2023 is the 50th anniversary, 5-0 anniversary of Twisted Sister. So it's Twisted it's Sister. It's coming up this and the, month. And the Rolling Stones, basically. Right. <laughs> well, it's Rolling Stones a little They're a little bit older, but, but yeah, I'm just slightly. saying. But, I mean, right. I was there at their 50th, and it wasn't too long ago. So, yeah. So, I mean, so you guys. Twisted Sister, it's our 50th anniversary JJ French was in the original band amazing yep. so tell us about what you're up to you, you have a TV show yeah well actually um, I have a uh, with my partner here um, I have a television network uh, wow internet uh, based um, our network is called uh, area 22 productions cool right sounds like some top secret installation like area right? 51 area, no yeah, we're better than area 51 it's we're more area interesting. 22 in any, any case, we have a multitude of shows. We're just revamping the station now, changing some of the format. But I have a show called 22 Now, where I interview people mostly from the entertainment industry, mostly. Other musicians, promoters, managers, some equipment, you know, companies. Um, once in a while, a business person comes on, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So it's, uh, it's 22 Now on Area 22 Buckets. 
Productions, and it is 7 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. Tuesday evenings. Awesome. Most of the time, it's live. So you can come in on the chat. Oh, that's cool. That's the one show we have that's live. Everything else is pretty recorded. Nice. And we do it live. Is that correct? Am I correct so far? That's my partner, Laura, right there. That's so cool. So, yes. So, yeah, and it's great. It's a lot of fun. And I get to sit back and talk to people. And it's, it's really... Um, it's really like I try to get people to, 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 to come on. Everybody, it's kind of like we're two friends hanging out talking. I'm not really interviewing someone, and they can also ask me questions. So it kind of kind of loosens up everything. And everybody comes on, they're skeptical. Some people are skeptical because they think I'm going to tear them to pieces. None of that. No, there's none of that. I'm telling you, there really is none of that. Hello, everyone. This is Neil Turpin, and you're watching The Metal Voice. And with us right here is the one and only Chris Impelitary. Chris, it's so great to see you, and Thank you. congratulations on being inducted in the Metal Hall of Fame. Oh man! Thank I just you. want to say, well Thank deserved you. and amazing to, to meet you for the first time. Thank you. It's my honor. It's my pleasure. Um, and hello, Jimmy, it's the Metal Voice. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, it, it's a great honor, and I'm really happy, mainly for our fans. You know, because we're really an international band. Most of our popularity in places like Japan, certain places in continental Europe, America, you know, not as much. So to be embraced and be honored like this, it's uh, truly an honor. Well, it's really great to, to have the opportunity to speak with you because I remember, um, you know, your band, uh, you had the album Stand in Line with Graham Bonnet also on vocals. I think Chuck Wright was in the band. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think who else was in the band. There was God Rest His Soul was Pat Torpy. Pat oh, Torpy played in a band right. called Mr. Big. He played uh, Robert Plant. Pat was just insanely talented guy. Um, we miss him already, but yeah. So it was Pat Torpy, um, and then Phil Wolf was a keyboard player we had at that time. And people think you know, Stand in Line was our first record. It actually wasn't. It was actually our second record. Right. You also did. Records with Rob, Bob Rock. Yeah, he did the originally. first album. We call it, and we did it, the Black EP before Metallica. So we did a thing called the Impelitary Black EP. That was a real black album. It was a real black one, yeah. It was, it was pre-Metallica. Pre and that was a song, or, or I'm sorry, the, the music or the record or the recording that kind of got everybody interested in the band, especially in places like England and Japan and, and certain places of continental Europe. And we were, you know, that first record, it was like I was telling you earlier, it was like Maiden and Priest on steroids. And yes, we had a lot of the fast solos and the screaming stuff, but we really just wanted to be a metal band. You know, so the Stand in Line record was the full length version and Graham came in because Rob had quit. So we had to completely change our sound really to compliment Graham. So it was, it was really a very successful record in various countries, but it was really uncomfortable for me to make because I was like, I'm going from the Maiden and the Priest into more of the Rainbow, you know? So, interesting. But, but it was an interesting time, and you know, I will always be grateful to Graham. He was an amazing singer, and he returned eventually. We did a record called System X with him, and then we did impelatory music, more like the, the Maiden and the Priest kind of stuff, but now Graham's singing. So. so that's such an interesting dichotomy. So you have this, this uh, kind of direction, certainly, in the beginning that was just natural, right? That's kind of what you felt. You had the, the, the natural influences. And then the next album you kind of had to adjust, you, you had to uh, co compensate or adjust and try to, you know, I guess, work with Graham's Yeah, and, and listen, I was, he's a great singer. I was 21. Great 20, writer, too. Yeah, I think I was 21 or 22 when I started at least the recording process of those records. And it was a really good education for me to learn, okay, wait a minute, Rob and I, we grew up playing in bars together, doing covers, you know, doing the Aussies and the Deep Purples and all that stuff. So when I got to Graham, it was like, oh, I have to change the writing style to accommodate his voice. At least at that time, I thought I had to do that. So we did, and it was an education of, well, how do we write differently? How do we, you know, use more orchestration and, you know, things like that. But you had the acumen to be able to do that shift because there's not, you know, just because a person can shred on the guitar or play, you know, chords or, you know, just tear it up doesn't mean that they're a prolific songwriter. And that's and, and also someone who can you know kind of be multimodal, go into a different mode of of even heavy metal. Yeah, you know I got to be honest. I've always been first into a really great riff, and then a good song, and then the guitar solo. It's never been about okay. Now let me write a song or a riff. Never been about that ever. You know I I, I know as I was telling you earlier, I got thrown in with all of the shredding type guys and stuff, which and it was you know look. 
I was young when we did those records, so I'm sure I certainly didn't help to put out the fires when I should have, like, all right, enough of this. We're not an instrumental band, we're a metal band. But, you know, having said that, you know, um, over the years, I, I learned to mature, but I always kept my focus on, all right, if we're going to make music, everything we do always has to start with that great riff. And then it has to have a great song, it has to have an anthem for a chorus, it has to have good melodic structure. Then the guitar solo becomes hopefully like a frosting on a cake. Hopefully it makes the cake taste a little better. Or maybe not. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, that's, I couldn't say it better myself. I mean, that's, that's uh, absolutely what, what a team player, what a, what a person who is trying to, you know, push the team, push the song is about, as opposed to, you know, look at me type stuff, attention seeking. Yeah, it's, it's again, and, and I can see where people would throw me in that category, especially, look, I mean, when I did the Impelitary Black EP and Stand in Line, you have to forgive me, I was really young, so for us, when you start having the ability to play fast, you just want to show off. And we're young, we don't know any better, we don't realize, all right, at a certain point, you're now just wanking, or, you know, and believe me, I got labeled as the wanker, or, you know, the masturbating guitar player, and to be fair to the critics, there was a certain point in the time where I went back and I listened to something and went, you know, oh my God, I think they're right, I'm going way too far, it's, you know, where's the melody, you know, and then all of a sudden I started listening to guys like Jeff Beck, and, you know, I'm not, and, you know, not to just say I went that direction, I certainly kept doing the speed thing, right, but I tried to learn around that, you know, to see how could I, you know, complement the song, keep the speed stuff, but be more mature and make it palatable, right, especially to the non-musicians, because that's always the challenge.